Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode. This is your host, David Kim. Hello, Mubarak. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm very fine. Thank you so much for having me here. So, uh, how old were you when you developed the first software and then you started your first startup? I was 16 years old when I started. That's when I developed my first software. Uh, how about the startup? Well, you you started a startup right after the graduation of high school, right? Um, it was actually during high school. The very specific time that I started working on the startup was I had personal experience coming up with projects. And the projects that we were coming up with were projects that were entered in different levels of competition. So like we had a district level, we had a regional level, provincial level, and national level. And then in all that, you have to constantly work with people, raise money, convince them to work with you. Then you face issues of plagiarism, teachers sometimes not liking you, sometimes not getting marks. So in that whole process, you get to learn about one, uh, dealing with multiple people, convincing people, and asking people to really support your project in terms of finances, in terms of the school helping, in terms of teachers vouching for you. So with all that, it gave me an experience that was so deep because uh, the very first time I started to participate in those science fair competitions was when I was like in the second year of high school. And I got to the national level with like two different projects that didn't actually get any awards. So in that whole experience, it had situations where you have to like work with your parents to, to raise money because sometimes they refuse and be like, this is something that doesn't make sense. And then even for teachers, they can refuse to support it. So that whole experience of going through and dealing with multiple people by the third year of my of high school, I was coming up with projects that are more refined my way of discussing with people was more refined and I was very clear and even dealing with competition was much easier. So that whole thing is no different from what I do even today because I come up with projects. The only difference is that today it's a company and when it's a company, you have to meet obligations of business, obligations of taxes, and then you're faced with a number of threats from uh, issues of funding, from issues of uh, customer payments and lack of consistency. So you have to make it constantly predictable. That was how I started out. So by the last year in high school, I had a final project where it was a database. And the database was for mainly tracking uh, oil tankers. And so when I came up with that, it gave me insight on what was my next course of action. My next course of action was uh, making uh, websites, which at the time I was getting multiple requests from people in school, uh, teachers who wanted me to help out with those things. So it was pretty much like a normal thing that I'd been doing in my time in high school, where you're trying to help people figure out stuff of websites and issues of, of web apps. So by the time I was just done with high school, uh, I, I, the very like, two months after I left high school, I, I created a site for a contractor, a company that uh, is an internet service provider, and they were really happy with the work that I did. So with that, uh, two months later, I went to South Africa, and the same person that had done the website for looked for me and gave me 15 domains to host. These 15 domains changed my game in business for, like forever. I got I got the largest supermarket chain in Kenya. I was hosting them immediately and they were paying $400 a month. For the first time I could pay an office, I could pay a salary myself, and I could put costs for the business just from one single customer. And I'd been given 15 of them. And these were corporate customers who were not startups. These were companies that had over 500 employees and we were doing things like DNS management for them, email management, and visiting their branches to support them. And that's pretty much how I started out. I see. I found an article, very interesting article about you, which basically say, turn down a fully sponsored Harvard University scholarship to a start the million dollar company. Tell me more about the story. Um, I was in high school and my, my whole objective at the time was I wanted to be the best because I've been involved in multiple competitions that's from academic competitions where I'd excelled in computers and I'd also excelled in multiple science fair competitions within the country and also like uh, creating different projects. 
So that whole uh, arrangement gave me an experience where I one I I had to interact with multiple people where I could raise funds, I could be able to create different products where you can have people help you out on solving issues of business. So it gave me an experience that within the final year in, in high school, I was really skilled to a point of dealing with multiple things. And the difference also was the science fairs that we were involved in were a bit intensive because the environment is really competitive and very low on resources. So that whole experience, uh, winning two science fair awards gave me insight into how I could be able to run a project that is on mass scale, get clients on mass scale, support them on mass scale, and also be able to handle the relationship also on mass scale while keeping them professional and objective. So in my final year in high school, I was very interested in going to college and my focus at the time was going to Harvard. And the main uh, inspiration around it was that I'd been like the best in computers, like in all exams in my high school, where I had like certificates of all of them that I'd gotten. So I used to kind of feel like I was selling myself short if I was going to go to a school or like college in, in Kenya. So I decided that the, the next best thing for me is to go to Harvard. And that's what I was focused on at the time. So in that whole experience, I was uh, I was keen on trying to figure out how I could get in. So I got supported during the application process and multiple things were going. And it was an amazing experience. The only difference is that at the time, uh, there were competition needs that were coming up. Because one specific thing was that we had peers. I had peers who would who had already started out in business, especially in terms of commercializing projects that were not as successful as mine. They raised funds, they got an employees. So it was becoming a problem to say that I'd focus on going to college when you have a direct alternative where peers are raising money, they've gotten awards of separate things, but those awards were not like the science fair. Those ones just involved applications, but they got lucky. So if, if they didn't have an experience as much as I did uh, because of the intensity of the projects I was involved in, but I felt like it was a gap that I missed. So in that whole process, I changed my focus. My focus became business. And I decided that since I was running projects that were commercially viable, especially because I've gotten interest from teachers, multiple investors reaching out, and multiple people wanting to help, it became clear that I could be I could be able to get customers. So I focused on creating websites, which I got customers initially. They were very few, and the initial focus was just business. And that's how I started out the company. I didn't think at the time that it would be a multi-million dollar company because when I started, my focus was just to compete. And then when I, I started to get clients that were bigger companies that have over 500 employees, and then we would do things like DNS management, they do retainer payments, where I could be able to pay salaries, pay, pay office space, and pay my personal salary. That's when it almost became a multi-million dollar company without me actually realizing because the scale of what we were doing was at that level. So that's how I actually started out. When you started a hypocentry uh, technology and investment, yes. uh, also right after high school, I mean, was a startup full-time job for you from the beginning? Or, I mean, how did you uh, finance your the operation or activity uh, in the beginning? Uh, the job was a full-time job. The main reason was three years before I started Hype Century in high school, I was involved in projects that were mass scale. They involved a personal life where I had to constantly raise money, sustain myself, think of the future, think of my next move. So in all that period, I used to have savings. I'd created multiple projects and I knew how to run finances as an individual. So by the time I was starting High Century, I was very clear I am running now a business and not a project. And that was my focus. So we had a company account, funds separately, uh, funds separately kept from my personal finances, costs separated, bills paid separately. And so yes, it was a full-time job. I'm looking at your website, uh, uh, which you say that the Jaga's core product uh, is web platform targeting micro business with 10 employees or less. 
that sounds like a quite a niche in targeting and positioning. What yeah. major problem of your customer you are solving uh, with, with the Jagas business? I mean, app and Jagas business model. And then, what are the key features of the app? And please tell tell me exactly how it works and how you Jagas business model works. Uh, so the first thing, let me answer the question by starting with the problems. The main problem that we solve for small businesses, micro businesses, is is mainly an issue of uh, startup cost. It's very difficult and sometimes impossible for small businesses to start because of the startup costs, especially right now in the digital era, because of costs of multiple separated products. You find a company that's starting is paying for web hosting and then they pay for a website and then they go and pay a subscription for marketing. When you do the math for a small business, especially in Africa or even anywhere in the world, those costs are just too high. For an individual that's probably one employee and it's a small business. So the main problem we solved initially is the problem of startup cost for a small business, where you can be able to come onto Zagis, you're able to use the product, and you never need to pay for an additional subscription. You're not paying for a hosting, you're not paying for a website, you're not paying for a marketing team, you're not going to look for a different subscription there. And then the second problem we solve is usually efficiency. What our product does is that we've created an ERP that is similar to what Oracle does, to what SAP does. But what makes it different from all those is our distribution model. Our distribution model allows where companies can be able to switch between systems. And the main reason why we've come up with that innovation is because we solve those things more like about training, complexity on using the software, where a business can be able to use it without training a small person who is just starting, you can use it the same way you use a Facebook account. And that's one of the main issues we solve. So what happens is that today, if I start a business and we are using two features only, let's say sending invoices and just keeping book, uh, book, book keeping records. Tomorrow, if we want to expand to more features, it becomes complicated for a small business because they probably have to buy another software get training or have all those issues but now what we've done we figured out a way in which we've packaged small business solutions which are erps basically in simple and easy to use formats that do not require training that do not require explanation where a small business today they have two features tomorrow they want five they just switch it switches their website it switches their mobile app and it switches the way they run their business and there are issues solved there are issues of efficiency so you find a small business can operate very seamlessly without so much trouble. And then now the biggest problem, the third problem that we solve is an issue of, of uh, is an issue of support. So the, 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 the reason why Facebook has succeeded as a company is because they have invested heavily in their brand as a social network. So when people use Facebook, people know what poking is and what likes are. When people use Zagis, people know what Zags are and people know what Zag apps are, but they don't know what an ERP is. But in literal sense, we are selling to them an ERP. So our innovation is to solve that issue of support. You find the main reason why SAP, Oracle, or even Microsoft do not focus on selling uh, ERPs to small businesses is because of support costs. You find a small business can pay you $50 in a year and they want to call you a hundred times. They call you every day, each and every time, and they think like they really added value, but the economics are not good for business. But Facebook has achieved the same innovation through another way where a small guy who does not have training or who does not have any technical knowledge can have a Facebook account, have friends, because he can ask another friend who knows something, which is the same concept on Zagas today. We've implemented those things called Zagaps and Zags. A small business can use a Zaga and a Zag and just simply ask another business that's using the same thing. And the support cost issue is solved. No need for training, no need for moving data, and it becomes a standard way of accessing software, which ends up achieving our goal of making so enterprise software basic and accessible to all using that innovation. So undefined in terms of features now, that those were the main three problems we were solving, the issue of, of cost, startup cost, efficiency of small businesses, and issues of support, which are a big problem for that type of uh, a business, for small businesses. And then now when it comes to features, we, we have standard features that 
uh, like a full ERP functionality, like a standard ERP. That's the reason why we have clients that are, are big companies that have up to a thousand employees, and we have clients that have up to two employees. The main reason why we focus on small businesses is because the market is big for us as a business because of our innovation. But if we get a big client, fine, we take them. So in terms of features, you find the things that the large company uses are the same things that the small company uses. The only difference now is, is the consistency, access, and, and probably uh, the number of times they access the application. So you find it has things like accounting, payroll, human resource management, sales management, supply chain management, even manufacturing. So the innovation we have is that you find one Zagap has manufacturing and it has payroll only. Then you go to another one, it has manufacturing, payroll, and sales. Our understanding of it is that these are business systems that are separate and they are informed by documented case scenarios. Documented case scenarios are more like we've established if this is a business that's running a supermarket, these are the features that they are using. So if tomorrow another business wants to do the same exact thing, they'd come and say, we want a package like for that other business. And then they use it exactly that way. And they get the same exact features like a company that's running Oracle or ERP with all the features from accounting to payroll, human resource management, storage, email, all the packages that we would require to run a business without ever needing to go to another point tool provider. So basically, that's what we, in terms of problems and in terms of features. How do you make money? I use, uh, you make money by membership or the selling the software? We make, we make money by subscriptions. Uh, or it's a SaaS subscription where people pay monthly fees. They pay monthly or annual fees for each user that uses the product and for the amount of, of data stored in the, in the application. Our innovation has figured out a way in which we can, we can, we can be able to have storage, uh, used by businesses over a long period of time and also things like subscriptions of now the number of users per company. Those are the two main ways we make money. And then from that, we also make money from resellers that are able to acquire those uh, businesses through uh, channels or partnerships or any arrangement that has business development activities. So those are our main revenue channels, but we have a number of customer acquisition channels that are separate. I understand that Jagas is addressing pain point of the micro business and uh, SMEs, but isn't it hard to sell the services product to such a small companies? Uh, they are not well organized. They don't have much budget for the long term investment. In most cases, basically, I can imagine they're too busy with dealing with uh, a lot of issues every day. Is that the case? How how did you find so, that? So that's what the innovation does. You know, our, our innovation is about one, the branding. And then number two is about user interface. It is simple and easy to use where it becomes simple for a user who's used Facebook before. We are looking at internet users who have been users of Facebook. So if you use our interface, you get an experience where you're using Facebook. You don't need to be explained to by anyone. You don't need to be shown what this is. And we've invented, we've come up with multiple ways to do all that from things like tooltips. Tooltips are more like if you see a complicated feature inside there, there's a description there if you just put your mouse key there. And, you, and you've learned it, something that would require training in another instance. So what we've done, we've come up with an innovation where we've simplified use and access of a complicated system by using standard methods like Facebook-like uh, uh, experience where our main reference has been to come up with an experience like Facebook where you're getting a small business owner who does not know what a router is, who does not even know how to use a computer, but he knows how to use Facebook because he has friends that use Facebook and talk about it. It's the same kind of thing we leverage. We leverage very little uh, ex user knowledge, but we, we turn it into an experience based on that social network effect. And we simplify the user experience, similar to something like Facebook. So you are using it because someone else is using it. 
and they can understand it easily, and then that can be replicated. Can you please describe how company has grown for the past seven years since the establishments and how is it performing in terms of annual sales, number of subscription, client? So from when we started, when we started 2013, most of 2013 and 2014, we were purely a company doing development. In 2014, we, we launched our web app. When we launched our web app, within the first year, we had close to 10,000 uh, businesses that had signed up. By around by around 2016, we hit a million dollar in revenue. By around uh, so from 2016 on to uh, 2021, we've done we've done we fluctuated uh, in 2017. We did around 1.5 in 2018. We we went down. We did 1.3, and then in 2019 we came back up. We were now at uh, 1.8. 2019. We, we did around around 1.9, and then by last year, we were doing around $2, $2 million in revenue. That's in yes. annual revenue. And getting uh, customers, approximately 1.8 million paying customers by the end of 2020. Very good. I see the Jagas is based in the U.S. now. You are from the Kenya and Africa. You moved the business to U.S. and how did you find the employee in the beginning? Was it easy or did they doubt and ask you about, uh, I mean, you have the investor money to pay, pay them because, I mean, you, you are not from the U.S. originally or your company moved to the from the Africa. What is the advantage of operating business in U.S. versus Africa? Uh, the main advantage is this. The ecosystem in Africa is underdeveloped and sometimes, in some cases, non-existent. So the, you find that operating one in the U.S., you have access to facilities from things like credit, to markets, to investors, to technical talent, to, to even solutions to basic problems of business operation that would otherwise take longer in Kenya. And then the other problem is that the market in Kenya requires political patronage to operate. So what that does, it puts the business in, in a situation that's a cycle of elections. If the election comes on, on politics changes, the business is affected and you cannot keep growing. So, and then it, so it exposes the business to a very bad type of turbulence that is not easy to sustain a company that is focused on goals that are, are, are big in terms of scaling. So, and when I moved to the US, the very thing that really helped me quite a bit was the fact that I had a reputation in the circles of people that I was operating with. Multiple people who were meeting me and as employees and people who are service providers knew me prior to meeting. So I wasn't explaining myself to anyone. I was already on Forbes 30 under 30. I'd already raised money before. I'd run a company. And, and so, and then I was in being introduced by investors who are professionals and who also have, uh, have a reputation in those circles. So I never even had a chance to explain anything to anyone or like justify myself or anyone is doubting me. No, there was nothing like that because most of the people I was dealing with have a reputation that is clear. And then if, in case there were back and forth or issues, people would simply refer to the reputations or those people and then matters would flow. So it, it was never a big deal for me moving because of the issue of a reputation. Got it. Yeah. So you told me that you are not uh, focused solely on African market. Then where do you have your customer base at the moment and uh, in terms of so like, country market? As of, today, as of today, we have almost 10 million signups. Of the 10 million signups, we are talking close to 4 million signups that are in, in Europe, New Zealand, Australia, in the US, even in, even some are in, are in Asia, in places like, in places like Pakistan, in places like Dubai, where small businesses are, have signed up. And you know, for small businesses, the products are, are not very different from when the type of people that buy products for things like websites and web hosting, because you find the type of subscriptions and things they do are almost similar. So those are the customers that we have acquired around the world. And right now we are counting close to 4 million signups of people that have nothing to do with Africa. And we never have anything to do with Africa because they are small businesses. I see. Uh, let's uh, switch gear for a second. Let's talk about the fundraising. Uh, fundraising is one of the biggest challenges for most startup entrepreneurs, I think. 
But it seems like you have a quite a smooth journey in raising capital, moving the office headquarter to U.S. I mean, did investor love your idea from the beginning, or I mean, also in terms of your time management, how much time do you uh, spend in fundraising? Okay, so the the okay. Let me before I answer the question directly, let me explain something about myself. One of the main reasons that this thing of fundraising has been easier for me is because I was running projects in high school that required fundraising, where you constantly have to think of budgets, sustaining costs, and constantly you are you are keen on ensuring that the things you are doing are financially viable. So that created some sense of awareness in, in me. That is different from what people do nowadays. In terms of you, right now, you find some people are applying for awards and they get lucky, and then they think that's startup capital. So it's more like lotteries to them. But they don't have the experience like I, I did. You know, I was having an experience of science fairs where you go through multiple levels. Where if you get if if you fail, you go back to school, and and it's just it's just a failure. So you don't think beyond the award. You don't think beyond. That check. So for me, that experience really helped me in in my personal life and organizing business. So that when I was closing deals, it wasn't about that deal only. It was more about what's next, what's happening tomorrow, and how we sustain that. So in terms of fundraising, uh, the very first time even I was moving to the U.S., I I, I received a check of close to three hundred thousand without signing any agreement. I signed the agreement close to six months later because. Of uh, one, I was introduced to them, and then two, the things that we were doing had direct value add, and the networks were similar. So that was the very first thing that really helped me in terms of uh, raising uh, uh, huge amounts of money. And then the other thing that was easy when it came to sustaining fundraising was the aspect where uh, multiple times we were I was operating in circles of people where people who've been clients before. People who've seen the work before, or people who've been introduced, and then that whole process made it so much easier. Because if you talk to someone today and you call them um, uh, next year or two years down the line for money, it's so much easier for them to write you a check, and 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 that's how the whole ecosystem has worked for me. Not to mention we've had issues like sometimes money delays and things like that, but overall it's worked out so well. And and it's really helped. And then now the piece about the U.S. also brings in an issue about investor confidence because we uh, because of things of reporting oversight and transparency. So investor confidence is increased as opposed to the type of business operation in Kenya where issues of reporting, transparency, and oversight are very different. So it opened a whole new game of players being comfortable, and you're also understanding that. There's room for solving issues in case this happens. So those case scenarios are all covered in a way that it fits. So it becomes easier if you call somebody for a check of a million dollars. It's much easier for them to write it to you, which was the case for me. I see. So you feel that you made a right decision to move to、uh, your company to the U.S. Then. Um. So so how I look at it, I didn't move the company. I moved the headquarters. Yeah. Mainly because of、uh, issues of politics, you know, the political environment in Kenya is so bad. Because you know, I previously ran a business in Kenya where I had gotten like the largest companies in Kenya as customers, who, if they were not customers, they were partner indirectly, or they I had dealings with them. So I have a clear understanding of the market and the operations around the ecosystem in Kenya. So the issue was. If I was going to grow any bigger in Kenya, it would mean expanding into businesses that are not my core business. Like you find businesses in Kenya that do、uh, like web hosting. What I was doing at the time, you are having buildings you are renting out. Then you have another business on the side. So it's more for the, for for the cost to balance and for you to do proper balance sheets. You are doing like ten different things at the same time. Yet there's a market out there that is just enough that can sustain only my circle of competence. And so I moved to the U.S. because of that, because the U.S. was presenting an opportunity where I could be able to sustain my circle of competence without getting into things that are irrelevant to what I do as an individual, or what is relevant to my skill, or what is my circle of competence. So I do not regret it. It was、uh, an important decision 
that brought sustainability in the things that I was doing. Okay. So what do you mean by uh, you have a headquarter you in US? You have company register in Kenya or the US? Um we we have a company uh we have a company registered in uh in the US called US. Okay. Our company and okay. it operates and it then incorporated multiple states. And then the company in the US owns a company in Kenya. We have a company in Dubai, in Mauritius, they are subsidiaries basically. That so par owned. parent parent company is registered in US now. Right. Holding company. Okay, I see. Yes. Not holding, yeah. it's parent because it's operating also. Okay. Okay, I see. Yes. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Who are your competitor? Uh and uh, what is special about your business model as compared to your competitor? Um, so uh the 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 two that I consider competitors, one is QuickBooks, which even their business is not directly affected by what we do. The only similarity between what we do is the type of customers we address, but not direct competitors. The only people I consider competitors are people who are offering point tools. Point tools, somebody is saying they have a feature like accounting, which they sell to small businesses. Someone else has this thing they sell to storage to small businesses. So all those people who are small business, they are buying the products from very different people. But as we found a way to make that whole experience into one, and we've, we've used uh, an architecture that's enabled to make that possible. And that's what our innovation is. And that's what's the difference. So that now things that were point tools for a small business, where like a, you have to figure out where you're buying storage, where you're buying email, where you're buying web hosting, where you're figuring out the issue of the website, where you're figuring out an issue of a marketing subscription. Now on Zagis, a small business does not need to do any of those, all those things. They use it in one place and they would never need to go anywhere else. That is the main focus of what we, we, we are solving. And basically, we've been making enterprise software basic and accessible to all, which is what is different from those guys doing point tools. And in as much as those guys doing point tools have, have market shares that are significant, you cannot compete in an environment where they are combined services, especially because of the issue of cost. Because one, there's a, an issue of cost of development, when it comes to things like the products that I do. And then two, there's also barrier of entry when it comes to things like branding and how you structure the product in a way that people, people can separate complex stuff from the simple words. So those are the things that are, are different from what we do. So we even get customers because people are just excited what Azag is and Azag app is. But in reality, they're just playing for an ERP, which is just, which is just, uh, which is just how small businesses work. They don't want stuff that's complicated. You start explaining what an ERP is. A small business is like, what the hell? But of course, our features are ERPs. But what we are selling are Zags and Zagas, which is the packaging and the innovation we come up with. Got it. Yeah. What do you have on top of your mind for the next step for the Zagas and your end game as entrepreneur? Um. Uh, then our focus. Our focus is that as of today. We have close to 70 million business leads. That's in small businesses around the world, especially acquired from circles of the internet to sellers, partnerships, and those circles around the industry of web hosting. So our focus is that at uh, a later date, uh, within the next 10 years, we will reach uh, a total number of close to 500 million businesses that will be using our, our product, which should make us a leader of SMB software around the world. So small business software it will become a basic thing in the path of a small business to scale, start, and grow. That's what we will be doing in the next 10 years. And in all that process, we will be looking to raise money different through different rounds to meet cost of customer acquisitions and also to go public eventually. Uh, thank you so much for the taking time to be on the show, the sharing the, your interesting story. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing and hearing you from you again the, with a more exciting uh, story of your journey. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, share with your friend, and drop me a review. Goodbye.